This is the Vermont House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development, Friday, January 21st at 1.07 in the afternoon. Um, we're here this afternoon to uh, look at Bill H-406. Um, we have with us Representative Brian Chena, uh, who is the main sponsor of the bill, um, to walk us through and, and uh, uh, give us uh, uh, everything that, that uh, the reasons why he, he put the bill in and, and what the bill tends um, purports to do. And so we're looking forward to that conversation with Representative China. So Representative China, welcome to Commerce. We're glad to have you with us this afternoon. We look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Um, is there a time range that I'm aiming to stay within so I can pace myself and make sure I deliver the information efficiently? Yeah, you're the only one standing between us and, and adjourning at three o'clock. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's what I was afraid of. <laughs> um, you have to have a sense of humor when you know you're talking at a computer so much. So <clears throat> thanks for having me in today. I prepared a slideshow to help um, keep us on, on track. Um, to start, I'll say that this bill, H406, which is an act relating to promoting racial and social equity and economic opportunity and cultural empowerment. It's a bill that was developed um, in partnership and on behalf of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. And the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, um, we developed a policy agenda for this biennium um, that followed the acronym ACT, A-C-T. There's legislation that focuses on the A, acknowledging the history of racism in our state. And we uh, have taken some action around that with the uh, resolution declaring racism a public health emergency, as well as proposal two. Um, C is creating new systems of government. And um, we, we've done that this session with H210, which created the Health Equity Advisory Commission. And we're looking at, um, promoting health equity and addressing um, disparities um, by creating a new system of government. And uh, the T is transforming existing systems of, of government. So the bill that I'm gonna present to you today, it, it's part of that work. Um, and you'll see that it acknowledges the history of systemic racism. It suggests creating some new systems of government and transforming some existing ones. So on that note, I'll, I'm gonna pull up this, the um, presentation. And I always, I make the same joke all the time that I hope you don't see my to-do list because I don't want you to experience vicarious trauma. Um, okay. <laughs> so this, you should see at this point, the presentation, I'm looking for some kind of head nods that people see it. Yes, oh, and I see it's on the screen in the background. <clears throat> so H406, an act, an act relating to promoting racial and social equity and economic opportunity and cultural empowerment. So, there's a lengthy legislative intent section of the bill. Uh, it says that equal opportunity is a fundamental principle of American democracy and equal access to economic opportunity and to cultural empowerment are priorities of the state of Vermont. However, structural racism defined as the laws, policies, institutional practices, cultural representations and other societal norms that work together to deny equal opportunity this structural racism has resulted in wealth disparities and cultural disempowerment among Vermonters. And wealth disparities are a function of not only access to income, but also the ability to have access to land, to property ownership, and to cultural preservation and empowerment, which has been impacted by race, ethnicity, sex, geography, language preference, immigrant or citizen status, sexual orientation, gender identity, socioeconomic status, and disability status. And wealth disparities and cultural disempowerment directly and indirectly affect the health and wellness of individuals and communities. Um, you, you, we heard recently the governor spoke about marketing um, and um, the symbols we use are important, like they are, they're marketing. So I incorporate some of that into the presentation. So you can see here that I have the original seal of the Republic of Vermont, so this is like some of the earliest marketing and branding of our state. Um, and it's significant because the roots of systemic racism go back to the foundation of our government. So the foundation of our current economic system was built on land that was taken from a Beneke and other indigenous persons, such as the Mohican, 
in the South of the state. And the structures of our economic system were constructed with the labor of enslaved persons. And this legacy of settler colonialism and chattel slavery has been modern day systemic racism and discrimination, which is embedded into many aspects of our modern way of life on this land. Uh, the relationship between all persons and the land has been used to oppress people over the past few cent several centuries. The laws and policy of our policies of our state and nation severed indigenous persons from their land while denying them, black people and other people of color from having the opportunity to access and own land. These actions of the state led to systemic racism that have impacted all Vermonters who have historically dis suffered from discrimination. And I list um, those same uh, elements of, of the, the uh, protected status. I'm not gonna repeat it all. Uh, the actions of the state have led to the erasure and appropriation of culture for the descendants of slaves and indigenous persons. And you can see here, I have the seal of the state of Vermont. We went from black and white into color. Um, and so now, last but not least, in order to offer repair for the systemic discrimination faced by many persons throughout the state over the past four centuries, the state of Vermont must engage in a just transition to an economic system that systemically undoes racism instead of reinforcing it. And efforts to remedy wealth disparity in the United States have traditionally looked to the free market economy for solutions to the very problem that that economy created. There has been an increased recognition that improving access to economic opportunity and cultural empowerment will require broader approaches. So in order to rectify this history of inequity, we must create economic opportunity and cultural empowerment using new systems that empower and center Vermonters who've historically suffered from discrimination. And I have our modern you know, branding here um, because we have an opportunity now to, as we rebrand our state, to put uh, the, our money where our mouth is, to put actions to words that we need to actually change the systems to align with the Vermont we're marketing and the, the vision we have for our state. So, I'm not gonna review this in detail, but there's a very detailed finding section in this bill and that finding section grew, it's a, out of a body of work. Um, it, it's a modification of the findings in the health equity bill, in the BIPOC land access bill. There was a lot of research by community members that went into th these findings. And so what I did here for you is instead of reviewing the findings, I'm providing you with a, like sort of a bibliography of the findings and people, on the committee or the general public can feel free to peruse these findings and learn more about the, the sources that um, shaped our findings. And also, I wanna thank the committee for taking this into account in your work um, last year when you looked at our fi findings, uh, it was brought to my attention, you looked at these findings and you took it into account in your work um, on, I believe it was H159, I might mess that up, and then it ended up in the budget. So thank you um, to, to you all in the committee, especially those of you um, who, who advocated that, um, that our research be considered in your decisions. So we, we thank you, um, Racial Justice Alliance and Seeding Power of Vermont who contributed to this work. So there's two pages of resources you can peruse in all your free time <laughs> that you might have, um, which I know we don't, but they're there on the record now for people to, to, to look into further. <clears throat> the purpose of the bill the purpose of this act is to invest in systems of economic advancement and cultural empowerment as a way to move towards greater social and racial equity in wealth distribution, health, resilience, and economic and cultural prosperity. So how are we promoting racial and social equity and economic opportunity and cultural empowerment in this specific piece of legislation that we've proposed? Well, we, we add some pieces to existing law that's the first thing it does. So here we add a fifth principle to the state's economic development principles. Um, so you can see the existing four, um, but we add in, uh, and maybe I'll read them just because I think it's good to review for the public and to remind us all as legislators what our existing commitment and statutes is, that Vermont's business businesses, educators, non-governmental organizations and government form a collaborative partnership that results in a highly skilled multi-generational workforce to support and enhance business vitality and individual prosperity. So I noticed that it, it says we have to balance businesses with the, the people and the individuals, you know, the organizations, the individuals. 
um, that Vermont invests in its digital, physical, and human infrastructure as the foundation for all economic development. That Vermont state government takes advantage of its small scale to create nimble, efficient, and effective policies and regulations that support business growth and the economic prosperity of all Vermonters. Vermont leverages its brand and scale to encourage a diverse economy that reflects and capitalizes on our rural character, entrepreneurial people, and reputation for environmental quality. So we propose adding a fifth principle that Vermont embraces its responsibility to course correct the historical impact of economic exploitation and exclusion from opportunity due to race and ethnicity for American descendants of slavery and the broader black, indigenous, and other persons of color community. And I just would add that there are other groups that we might want to consider, but this bill was, was created from the perspective of Black people. Uh, um, it was the Racial Justice Alliance, which centers um, Black people, cent centers American descendants of slavery, and then there's other people of color who work to support our Black family. So I want to say that this is has an Afrocentric and BIPOC focus in this category, but your committee should be taking into account all the other status, statuses I listed earlier in your decisions. That's just my, what I'd like to add to this, but I don't wanna take away from that this bill is a, a black led and black centered um, approach. So promoting racial and social equity in economic opportunity and cultural empowerment, we would add to the director of the Office of Economic Opportunities authorization to allocate available financial assistance for community services agencies and programs for the planning, conduct, administration, and evaluation of community service programs to provide a range of services and activities having a measurable and potentially major impact on causes of poverty in the community or in areas of the community where poverty is a particularly acute problem. And in existing law, we're, we're we are empowering the director to allocate funding in a way that secures and retains meaningful employment uh, for to obtain adequate education, to make better use of available income, to provide and maintain adequate housing in a suitable living environment, to obtain services for the prevention of narcotics addiction, alcoholism, and for the rehabilitation of narcotic addicts and alcoholics. This language could be updated, I would say, if you did choose to act on this. I don't know if your committee would be the place, but that's some dated language um, that we don't use in the profession anymore um, when referring to people with substance abuse challenges. Um, number six in existing statute to obtain emergency assistance through loans and grants to meet immediate and urgent individual and family needs, including the need for health services, nutritious food, housing and unemployment related assistance. To remove obstacles and solve personal and family problems which block achievement of self sufficiency to achieve greater participation in the affairs of the community, to make more frequent and effective use of other programs related to this chapter, and to coordinate and establish linkages between governmental and other social service programs to assure the effective delivery of such services to low-income persons, and to encourage the use of entities in the private sector of the community in efforts to ameliorate poverty in the community. And we're proposing we add an 11th um, authorization, which is to correct the historical impact of economic exploitation and exclusion from opportunity due to race and ethnicity of American descendants of slavery and the broader black indigenous and other people of color community. Now that's sort of, uh, I would say this is T, we're transforming existing systems, we're adding to an existing structure. The next section creates a new structure within the existing structure, creates the Vermont Department of Cultural Empowerment and Economic Advancement within the existing Agency of Commerce and Community Development. And it would work to ensure programming implementation through a statewide cultural empowerment and economic advancement network consisting of four community empowerment centers located in different regions of Vermont. And it uses the Vermont Department of Cultural Empowerment and Economic Achievement Grant Fund to design and implement a grant program for qualified organizations and collaboratives led by Black, Indigenous, and other persons of color that provides grants to support programming through the Cultural Empowerment and Economic Advancement Network. And we put in 10 million as a placeholder number. Um, it would be great to get that much to invest in this, but um, 
from experience, appropriations always, you know, they have to balance a lot of things and appropriations would, our appropriations committee would need to weigh in on this piece uh, inevitably. Um, and they often will, you know, they'll do what they have to do to make something move forward. And sometimes that means a uh, smaller budget. So, but we're, you know, in a negotiation, you aim high. <clears throat> I should have put a hundred million, but we have 10 million. So um, we'll see how that goes. Um, so just to summarize this, we're creating a new department and giving them a budget to do this work, to launch this network. Some of this work has already happened. Um, the Racial Justice Alliance in, ad, in, in our advocacy um, has opened the Richard Kemp Center in Burlington, in the old North End of Burlington. It's a few blocks from my house. Um, and already that cultural empowerment center is helping people get needs met, um, mutual aid style through and, um, you know, and re referring people to resources during the pandemic. And it's making a big difference and it just opened. So, you know, other parts of the state deserve this too, and they need to be coordinated. And so, you know, we've started this work in Burlington, but we'd like to see it extend to all parts of the state so that Vermonters in every corner, every, you know, valley, every peak have somewhere within a reasonable drive, you know, to go to, to have access to these, this, th these resources. <clears throat> so um, th this new department, um, there's a lot of detail here. I may not read all this to you because honestly, I get winded these days since getting being really sick with COVID um, and I'm starting to get winded and it's probably a blessing for you anyway, because you don't have to hear as much of me, but, <laughs> but <laughs> so, you know, we'll just look at the bright side, um, but <laughs> so aren't you glad you brought me on Friday afternoon so you can, we can, we can have some fun. Yes, of course. All right, so I'll keep moving though, because I know that I'm um, I'm the obstacle between you and the weekend. Although often obstacles can be a stepping stone, so we'll think the oh, little right. oh, right. right. good. So, <clears throat> so the, this new department would provide cultural empowerment programming, and it would involve you know educating people on history, contributions, and resilience of American descendants of slavery and other BIPOC. Uh, serve as uh, serve as a resource and facilitate and assist in implementation of cultural com uh, commemorations, celebrations, facilitate various cultural activities. Ser serve as a hub for 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 cultural arts. Um, you know, create community centers across the state for BIPOC to access and just you know build um, cultural infrastructure, which which is a major social determinant of health. Um, it would. Established the business cultivation and support program, um, which provides small business assistance, grants and loans, mentorship program, technical assistance, and small business procurement contract assistance. So really giving people some education and help to learn the skills to become more self-sufficient and succeed. Um, education is central to, um, to succeeding and not all of us have had access to the same financial education. Um, and, and a little bit goes a long way. A little bit of investment in, the, in that area really can give people that extra push they need to succeed. Um, business development. So we asked that the, this department in collaboration with existing um, pieces of government like VITA, the Vermont Center for Emerging Technologies, Vermont Small Business Development Center, and other relevant stakeholders. We asked that they come together in collaboration and design and implement a BIPOC business development program, which would increase the number of and provide support to BIPOC business startups, provide BIPOC-owned businesses with broader access to capital, and provide BIPOC-owned businesses with technical assistance. We also ask that the secretary, so these, this just to frame these, that these are this is uh this one is creating i believe it's we'd be creating a new system because we're creating a new program and this one <clears throat> we're we're asking i think we're doing the same thing we're asking an existing system of government to create a new piece to help which would be the bipoc business procurement program so this is this section is about business procurement and career advancement for people who haven't had equal opportunity for a long time and what we ask is that 
we would that they increase state government outreach to BIPOC owned businesses for participation in the bidding for government procurement contracts, that we provide technical and other assistance to BIPOC owned businesses that seek to participate in the government procurement process, that we establish a minimum percentage of state procurement contracts or funding that is awarded to BIPOC owned businesses. And we ask that the, the Secretary of Administration, in consultation with the Racial Equity Director, adopt rules that require each agency and department of the state to implement policies and procedures designed to create pathways for career advancement for current and future employees who are members of BIPOC communities in the state. And I can say that in my, I've, I've been in Vermont for 20, I'm going on 24 years, and I've seen many friends come and go who are BIPOC because they come to live in Vermont and they work hard and they just are not given opportunities for advancement in their organizations that they see other people getting. And when people call it out, there's retaliation. And there's it, it's not always the um, formal retaliation, it's the informal. It's, it's that you rub people the wrong way. And so many BIPOC out, out there have heard it's just not a good fit for you. But what does that really mean? Um, and a lot of times it means that people aren't that people lack cultural humility skills, that people don't understand cultural differences, that people don't understand that like the status quo is grounded in uh, it's grounded in the dominance of Anglo culture in this state that even uh, impacted Franco Franco Americans in this state and Catholics and others quite recently, that there was a push during the eugenics movement to eliminate um, any language use but English in the state. So, you know, there's been a long history of people learning that things are done a certain way. And then when people come in with different cultural backgrounds, including people from lower socioeconomic statuses, and we get a job somewhere, when we don't communicate the same as others, we're not a good fit. And so I think we have to acknowledge that, you know, Education is going to help that, but also consciously trying to create ways to just like um, historically, you know, I see I saw that a rep has a Dartmouth shirt. I went to Dartmouth. I have my mug like when I went to Dartmouth, there was this network that you could be part of there if you were, you know, um, a white male. Um, and that even white women didn't have access to where, you know, they would have corporate recruiting and they, you go and they give you all this free food and stuff and court you. But if you look at the trajectory, a lot of the, for example, black women I know who worked in finance or marketing in New York city, for example, don't progress in their job, but young white women soar past them. White men soar past them still. Why does that happen? You know, I think it's, we have, we have to, we have to take that into account and recognize that there's cultural influences there. So I didn't mean to spend so much time on this, but I think it's good sometimes to like give you real examples. And I've experienced this myself, but not the, it's not the same degree as it is for darker people. There's really a, there's a, there's discrimination that's based on skin color that gets worse the darker you are. So it's just, it's reality. The first step is being aware of it. The next step is us trying to change things so that um, we can dismantle that systemic racism. So uh, last but not least, we have continuing education and apprenticeship that the Department of Labor in collaboration with the state colleges and the Vermont training program within the Agency of Commerce and Community Development shall design and implement five continuing education and apprentice, apprenticeship programs for members of BIPOC communities in the state. So once again, trying to make some space for people who have fallen through the cracks historically to be provided an e equal access to something that many others have gotten before. Um, so all of this you know, ties into um, work of this body in my time here since 2017, um, but it's, it started before that, but I'm gonna speak to my experience and the work of the Racial Justice Alliance that um, Vermont has made a commitment to dismantling systemic racism. So, you know, in 2017, we acknowledged racial disparities across all systems of state government in Act 54. And um, we committed to, quote, dismantling systemic racism, quote, in Act 9 of 2018. And that's when we hired the racial equity director, who's been doing an immense amount of work. And we need to consider, you know, better supporting that office as um, our current director, you know, continues that work. 
Um, we passed Act 33 last year, which created a Health Equity Advisory Commission empowered to address disparities and to promote equity in the healthcare sector and in, uh, you know, in influence state um, policy and appropriations regarding healthcare. We passed uh, JRH 6 last year, kind of at the last minute even, right? It was like the last few days, um, which declared that, quote, racism constitutes a public health emergency in Vermont, quote. And we committed in that resolution to, quote, eradicating systemic racism, quote. And we have proposal two coming before us, um, which was also, these are all initiatives that were, um, you know, developed by the Racial Justice Alliance, that proposal two came out of that work, where we recognized that although there's a, um, the story is that Vermont was the first state to abolish slavery, that our constitution still allows it. And perhaps it's not being practiced um, as it was here 200 years ago or in the South 140, 150 years ago. But it's still in our constitution. And if the constitution is the foundation of, of all of our laws and institutions, then it's powerful to pro prohibit indentured slavery and, and um, and indentured servitude and slavery in our constitution. So all of this goes together because we are, we're acknowledging the harm of our history, but we're also making amends. We're trying to make things better together. And um, H406 ties into um, that legacy. And H406, you know, would ask that we um, follow through on the commitment we've made and many other pieces of legislation over the last five years to dismantle and eradicate systemic racism. And it would do so by promoting racial and social equity in the economic opportunity and cultural empowerment. So um, there might be some little anecdotes. I, I forgot that I'll remember during the question and answer because there were some points I wanted to like weave into this, but I think that I hit them all. I think this would be a good point for me to breathe without talking and, and listen to your comments or take questions or, and I'll take the slides down for this part. That's okay, but I can always pull them back up if needed. Questions for Brian? Representative Tina? Stephanie? So Brian, thank you. I hope you're feeling better. Uh, so last session we passed so as part of Act 74, some of this was addressed in Act 74. And what, <laughs> and so um, <clears throat> he says, so do you feel like we, we addressed, we addressed some of this in, H, in, in, in Act 74, right? And so what pieces do you feel like aren't, well, there's some, what, what are the major pieces that you feel like aren't addressed in Act 74 that we should go forward with? I'd have to review Act 74 in detail to, um, give you a thorough analysis and answer. And I'm happy to do that and get back to you later. But I can say that from what I know, that um, that, <clears throat> that 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 network doesn't exist yet, right? And we didn't necessarily, like, I don't know if you necessarily um, changed um, the duties of these, you know, ask these different departments to collaborate the way, you know, those ways. So I'd have to review it, honestly. There, commit, there might be a committee member that can answer that better than me, because, you know, you know that yeah. bill. I, I, I bet Representative Mulvaney Stanek would know even. Um, yeah, yeah. And, 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 the, and the contract yeah. went out to do it to Curtis Reed's organization, I believe, to, to, to do the survey and kind of create um, pieces of that. So the other question I had was, um, does and speaking with a lot of people last last session, um, one of the thoughts was uh, that Vermont is one of the only states in the country that, under the Small Business Administration, doesn't have. And I, I don't I don't know if this wording is correct or not. It's a minority business development group or my, like a minority business so, so, you know, arm to it. And so there was that thought that maybe we should would would well, that that Vermont should do the do that the small business administration took a span to do to have to have a, a business group devoted to the BIBOC community in Vermont um, any thoughts on whether it should be in state government or it should be a federal organization what are your thoughts on that my first reaction is that the state and federal government both have a responsibility 
to address the legacy of systemic racism and it's interconnected. Um, <clears throat> it's also good though to not have duplication. So I'd probably want, you know, there's probably some things the federal should do and some things the state should do, but I'd need to like, you know, look more at what the federal government is thinking of doing and like reflect on how that compares to what we're suggesting. And like, this is a starting point, like, you know, a, when a bill, the legislative process is often that, you know, you introduce a bill, it's, it's rarely the same thing at the end, because it's the start of a process of taking testimony. And I think that if you were going to continue work on this bill, I would want to talk with you about additional witnesses to come in. And they would probably have expert testimony on some of these details that I don't know, because I have my own perspective as a social worker and legislator that a, that a, a person who runs a, a manufacturing plant they have a di totally different view so or a financial advisor um or a real estate agent etc so <clears throat> i guess what i'm saying is that i see this bill as a starting point and i'm hoping that um it'll it'll impact your conversations and your decisions on all of your legislation but if you chose to pursue this topic further i think we'd want to really dig into it with some more witnesses because then they could like help us assess like what are some things that really make more sense for the federal government to do and what are some areas where it makes more sense to localize it and have it be state and regional so thanks <clears throat> len go ahead Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Brian. I've, it's very, it's an interesting concept and interesting ideas in this. Uh, I find myself agreeing with many of your goals. And even some of your points are extremely well made. Um, we had a conversation I have, I've been reading lately about wealth gaps and wealth inequalities. Um, and there's one great big huge glaring factor for this. Uh, if we want to have workers build wealth, and we want to have housing for workers. The most obvious way for them to build wealth, the way most Americans build wealth, is to own their own homes. Um, you know, you mentioned in the, in the bill, the GI Bill, uh, two ways that allowed people to go and build wealth, mostly lower middle class people, people of all kinds and shapes who had never been able to live in houses that they owned. Up until that, they were able to get an education through the GI Bill. And it's important to note that only like two to 3% of the African-Americans who came back to the GIs, the black GIs came back were able to take advantage of that. But more importantly, it was through the home ownership, the mortgages that were uh, created to help the GIs that built the Levitt towns and developments all over, mostly starter homes. Um, this is how that whole generation, that greatest generation, our, my parents were able to go and um, build wealth. Um, you know, I, I look at, um, my, my father's a good example. He lived in New York City all of his life. He moved from apartment to apartment all the time, which tells me he probably didn't pay the rent. But what they did is when he was in his thirties and came back as a veteran, he was able without nothing more than a ninth grade education to borrow money and got out, get a four room uh, Cape Cod in New Jersey in a development and eventually sold that house at a profit to buy a bigger house. I mean, he was a longshoreman on the waterfront in New York. I mean, he didn't make a lot of money. And what he was able to do is build a three bed, uh, buy a three bedroom uh, raised ranch. And then eventually 25 years later to move and use that as his nest egg to move to Florida. And, and that was his nest egg to retire. So there is, um, there is a history of this for a whole generation. And of course the African-Americans, the black people who came back as GIs and maybe other ethnic groups, they were redlined. They couldn't buy those Levitt townhouses. I mean, this was a real disservice. It was blatant discrimination. And that wealth gap we talk about today, a lot of it comes from that because people like my father were able to go and get home equity loans to help pay for college education and a whole lot of other things. He had actually had a little bit of an inheritance. It wasn't much, but it was something. And um, so what I see here is that in Vermont, we're spending tens of millions of tens of millions of dollars every year to go and find, fund uh, trust, housing trust funds and housing apartment conversions and, and redo buildings to have apartments, <clears throat> but they're not, not helping anybody get it for you know, affordable housing. But between that and forever affordable, they're never able to get and build any equity or be able to go out and get their own home and build something. 
And we've got examples all over Vermont. There's, you know, everything in South Burlington and every large town has got houses from the 50s and 60s, early 60s that are ranch houses and very good starter homes. And um, when you're looking at worker, worker housing, you're looking at mid-level housing, the missing middle or starter homes, that's the kind of thing that we need. And I think we have some built-in barriers here that you don't mention in your, in your bill, but I think it's important to recognize we have Act 250 and land conservation efforts that have been creating barriers to this. I mean, it's impossible to build a development, the kind of thing, even a small development, that people were able to go and buy those out. I mean, you can't build anything, you can't afford to build anything but these McMansions, which don't really help anybody. Um, and I think part of the wealth disparity, this disparity we have is this is because, you know, this terrible discrimination from the, from the 1940s and 50s and early 60s. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that's really important. And I, I don't disagree with a lot of the issues you're raising because this would help build, would help raise everybody up regardless of their racial or ethnic or, or cultural background. You know, you mentioned the eugenics movement. There was a lot of people who were discriminated against in the eugenics movement. You know, if you weren't the old stock, you weren't worthy of being here. And so I think that, um, that that's something that, that I see as, uh, is that we, we really have to help do this across all people. I mean, I don't know if you need $10 million in government programs, but you certainly do need, you're, you're addressing an issue that I think is important. But, you know, Act 250 needs some work. It's 50 years old and I'm not sure it's, I'm not sure it's being applicable to the things that you're trying to talk about, but I do think it is applicable to that. And I'd like to hear what you're, what your statement on that is. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate your acknowledgement of the, the changes in opportunity that have happened across generations because uh, my grandparents were immigrants and they were able, despite all the racism and challenges, they were able to, in, you know, we, a large extended family living in one home or whatever, but we were able to like get a house, you know, like they were able to get a house that, and so I grew up in a house with grandparents, uncles, aunts, you know, brothers, sisters, and we all, you know, we had a bunch of disabled relatives and we all just took care of each other. But like my grandparents couldn't, eat, they were able to get that house because of what you just said. The economy was structured different then. Now you could, you could get a master's degree and be a professional and never be able to own a home. Most people my age cannot afford, that I know cannot afford to own a home. And I only own my home because my landlady and landlord didn't want to sell out to, they had seen my neighborhood be sold out over the years from family homes to like investment properties. And they, they, it, they didn't like that. So they worked with me over the course of years to like make it so I could own a home. It's like I, all the obstacles I had to face, I won't even get, get into here, but like, I'm so privileged that I had a landlady and landlord that cared about people, about exactly what you were just saying. They want to see a new generation have opportunity and they wanted to pass this, property that meant something to them, to someone who would care for it and not just sell out and make the profit. But that's rare. And there's so many policies I think we could look at like that might affect that. And I think the other thing is, I sent the whole body a letter and a plan that you probably didn't see because you get swamped with emails. So if you're interested, you can go back and search for it. It's called um, A Hope for a Just Recovery. I think that's what the, the subject line was. And I talked about, um, ideas related to this. And one of them is that we need to consciously plan and develop a complex and diverse continuum of housing options. And it's gotta be everything from like shelters and homeless um, encampments and places where pe when people arrive in the state, low barrier access, but then offering people a wide range of housing options, supportive housing, social housing, where they, you know, that's, that's um, run by the land trust and is permanently affordable. But furthermore, we need more rent to own and more like um, more housing that people can afford to buy and live in. Like what you were just saying, like we should be developing that. And the obstacle you bring up is very real. The way we've structured the economy is that housing is a commodity. So when someone's building housing, they want to make money. That's the, that's the, it's a free market economy. That's where we, where we live in. So we, but then we created all these rules and regulations that are are creating a uh, it's it's sort of 
if people want to make a profit, then they have to charge a lot more. And then now the construction expenses are even higher because of materials issues. So like we're really like facing a difficult situation. And I would, and this goes, strays away from this grant, but in that art, in that letter I sent you all, I say that we should create a fast track to redevelopment. Um, but that those redevelopments, we should start with the state and municipalities doing it to set an example. So designating some government land, like for example, the Windsor Farm or Burlington, the Sears Lane plot that homeless people were just evicted from, redeveloping some state land with a set of criteria and, and then saying to private developers, if you do what we're doing, you can do it. Like, like do it, go do that. And we could have a discussion over the next year about what are those criteria? And they could include everything from preserving permanent affordability, building equity for, for working families so they can retire. Cause like, that's a dream that many people may can't have right now. Like I'm probably gonna have to work till my seventies if I'm lucky, you know? And so, um, and that's, and being a frontline healthcare worker, I don't know how I'm gonna do that, but we'll, we'll, we're taking it day by day. But my point is giving more opportunities, a wide spectrum of opportunities for people to build equity and to have affordable housing. Um, and if, so if we had criteria tied to that, then I would support fast tracking private development where you know they could have some luxury units to make their money mixed with a wide range of units. So we're also bringing people of all different backgrounds together to live in a community together, because that also makes a community richer. Not when we segregate poor people and work, you know, the sort of like factory workers and then like the wealthy live in McMansions. What really makes community stronger is when people from all different backgrounds share space and build community together. So I don't know if that's helpful, but I, I hear you on the Act 250 thing, and I would support a fast track if it met like criteria that include racial social equity, our climate action goals and affordability, and et cetera. You know, so that's my thoughts. And if people want to read more about it, I did send you all an email. So I know there's more questions. So I'm I don't know if you have more to say, but I just said enough, I think. I just like to add you need water and sewer, you know, real water and sewer to keep keep things. You can't do it without that. All communities don't have that. So, the, so we have an opportunity now to really invest in the infrastructure of the future. And I think we also, we shouldn't just build what we need now. We have to be real. We want more people to come to Vermont. Like, I think a lot of us want that. Like the governor said, it, I want that. I like when new people move here. I like when people come back home after they go away. There's nowhere for them to live right now. There's places for people to work, but they're not necessarily the right jobs. For them, some of them are, some aren't, but there's nowhere for people to live. And even if they can get housing, they can't afford to live in Vermont. So um, <clears throat> I do think we need to, uh, to take that into account at, in our planning because it shouldn't just be like, what are the units we need now? But like, who, you know, how much more do we want down the road? How many refugees are we gonna get as climate change hits? It's going to happen. We could build an arc in Vermont. We could build, we could prepare for a million people one day. You know, we could be like, how do we house and properly take care of a million? And everyone's contributing, everyone's guaranteed a job, food, housing, you know, a social safety net that works. We could do that at this point in history if we're, if we, you know, create solutions together that are intersectional, that meet multiple goals at once. And I think there's a place for Act 250 to be modified if the development is working towards that. That's, I guess that's sort of, I think we we have some agreement on that issue. I don't know if you agree with everything I said, but I agree with you that Act 250 and development criteria should be looked at um, and modified to move us quicker to the vision of what we of the housing continuum we need. Emma? So we strayed a little bit from the bill, but it's it's relevant. It's germane. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, Representative China. Welcome again to Commerce. Um, I, one of the things that I really like about this bill, I read it when it was first introduced, when we were working on that element of H-159, 159 turned into an omnibus economic development bill. So there, the one piece of it, and then it eventually did go into the budget. But the one piece of it um, that uh, H1, H-406 helped to inform some of the, the beginning thinking, I wanna emphasize beginning thinking is that just in terms of the um, the piece that, that the bill talks about around better cultivating and supporting BIPOC businesses is a big, um, there's a big gap in Vermont. And it became clear after the 2020 economic relief grants that went out from the feds through the state that the state of Vermont really doesn't have an established 
um, regular relationship or even knows or keeps track of where the BIPOC businesses are in the state, let alone understanding regional variations, a BIPOC owned business in Burlington has very different needs and realities than say one in Newport. Um, and so I really appreciate how this starts to really name some, some of the little pieces of that conversation we started last session around the need for technical support. And I would add very responsive technical support that understands language access, access issues and understands and recognize different ways of bookkeeping that different businesses use. Um, uh, more informal, which is not even the race-based thing. It's like there's informal business um, practices and more formal ones and just providing technical assistance so that we can be moving resources um, to really support the economic well-being of, of these businesses, um, especially BIPOC folks. Um, I, think, I think that part of the bill is really builds off of that conversation again. And I, um, I, mean, and I think this committee knows we, we need to do more there. And that's why we, we earmarked $150,000 to really dive more deeply into understanding what we don't know. Um, I, I also personally think that the state of Vermont, as you said earlier, I agree, has a responsibility to do better in this realm, but also to undo decades, centuries of, um, of really uh, creating barriers and roadblocks to the economic well-being, as Representative Dickinson was saying, of BIPOC people in this state. Um, and, and the fact that there's a real impact when people don't have generational wealth. And if we're talking just about businesses, that's it's a much bigger topic, but businesses, if you don't have generational wealth, you don't have down payments for things, you can't open, you can't even get loans or have collateral and whatnot. There's such a ripple effect throughout generations. And when you look at today, and in the off session, I met with a lot of businesses, which are a lot, there are a lot of BIPOC owned businesses in my district and in the old North End area and, and um, even in Winooski. And this is a big thing today where people don't have capital to be able to buy the commercial stove or to um, expand their business even a little bit so they could hire a little bit more help because there is not a dedicated source of, of um, capital that is earmarked that they have a fighting chance of accessing. And then um, I think not to keep going on, but there's like implicit bias in lending and there's other pieces that we really have to uh, recognize and name. And if there's a role the state can play and if there is a role the, the state can play, I think that's really where we have to start exploring. So. Not so much a question, but I really appreciate that piece of it in particular around talking about access to capital and technical assistance and naming this contributes to generations of the racial wealth gap that have developed over the years. So thanks for being here. Thanks. Paul. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Gina, for the presentation. I very much appreciate it. Um, so I, I did kind of want to echo a little bit of what Emma said. I think, um, you know, talking about technical assistance and talking about just assistance in general for BIPOC owned business is important. I'm sure you remember, or maybe uh, especially uh, Brian and Emma on this call, you know, being from the Burlington area may remember um, an incident on Church Street or with a Church Street business recently um, where there, a gentleman uh, had tried to open a restaurant bar or, or club or lounge or whatever it, it was. Uh, and there was a lot of mockery going on around the internet. Um, it was clear when I watched those videos and, and, and read up on it on social media that this gentleman really was at heart an entrepreneur um, and really wanted to work hard and really wanted to make that business successful. But it was just very clear that the resources weren't there for him and he didn't have the knowledge he needed to execute um, you know, his plan. So he had leased the property, he had been in the property um, and he had run into fire safety issues. He had run into health issues and didn't understand health code. Um, but it was, it was very sad for me to watch that and see that situation unfold because being an entrepreneur myself and a minority myself, I knew and know that you know, resources and access to technical help and navigating these types of systems is scarce. So um, what I'm getting at with that story and sharing that is I really love the technical piece of this as well. And, and being able to, to uh, allow BIPOC folks and entrepreneurs in the BIPOC community to take advantage of the res those resources and, and have a place to go. Um, I would argue that those resources are scarce scarce for all people in the state, um, which is a special reason even to, to provide those, those special resources to that community. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I would want to add, and, and I would really like to echo Lynn's statement, uh, uh, definitely on the same wavelength uh, with Lynn, being in the real estate industry myself, I know that, uh, you know, the key uh, to wealth really is homeownership. And 
I'm wondering, maybe more of a statement or a question or a suggestion, I'm not sure what exactly it is, but I would love to see uh, you know, a, a piece of that $10 million dedicated to uh, a down payment assistance program for BIPOC community members, or maybe even a closing cost um, assistance program for BIPOC community members, um, because that would really make homeownership much more achievable. We still run into the same inventory issue, but we get rid of at least one barrier that is uh, <clears throat> a tall barrier for people. And, and I don't know if that's an option in this bill, um, to be added to it. I don't know if it's been thought about, but it's definitely something that I think about. And I could see um, I could see some real moves being made with a program like that in terms of getting people uh, into housing. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, I think those were my statements and questions. Thanks. Well, I, I, it's, I'm glad you, um, the, I, the thing that's freshest on my mind is the last thing you said, because there's a bill right now um, that is being, um, reviewed and considered by House General um, called H-273, and it specifically looks at land access and property ownership, like racial and social equity, and, and what we propose in that bill, and that bill was developed by a, a coalition of BIPOC community members, um, that it proposes that the state create a, a board that would be given a fund to invest in a variety of ways to support um, or to address equity issues in property ownership and land access. And some of those ways would be exactly what you just said, possible grants for down payment assistance or closing costs, financial education <laughs> programs for people, um, mutual aid. Because if, if people of color are moving to an area where there's not a lot of other people of color, sometimes it takes a while for people to get support from that immediate community and having mutual aid around the state to support people while that grows those relationships build is important. Um, <clears throat> there's other aspects, but the premise is that the state would give a group, uh, give a board made up of the impacted community money to develop criteria and a process for distributing those funds so that people can build wealth. And it's both collective and individual. So it doesn't just have to be owning your own home. It could be that a bunch of people want to get a farm together and, and start a, a home business. You know, there's flexibility there. Um, but I would encourage people to check out that bill. Um, and if you have, you know, opinions about it to talk to House General, because they are going to be hearing more witnesses. Um, also speak back, you know, you were talking about that technical assistance piece, and um, it goes back to education. And if we look at the social determinants of health, um, education is one of them. The more education people have, the better they do. Um, even if it, even if everything you learn doesn't apply to every situation, like there's plenty of things I learned in college that I barely use, but every now and then I'm like, oh, that's useful. And the process of learning and, 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 dig you know, learning about stuff and talking about stuff and sharing like that, that the, the, um, becoming comfortable with education is, is something that many people aren't because of the horrible experiences they had in our education system. So we really need to be thinking like about lifelong learning and how do we create like sort of low threshold access to all kinds of education, um, you know, every possible, you know, creative way. Um, so this, you know, this, if I look at, I'm looking at a list of social determinants of health from the World Health Organization, education is one of them, but this bill would also look at housing, basic amenities in the environment, it would look at social inclusion and non-discrimination and a really significantly structural conflict. Structural conflicts of social determinant of health, it results from conflict people have with the system, you know? And, and like a lot of us, I mean, I guess I can't speak for you all, but I, cause I see the world through my eyes, but like my whole life has been structural conflict on many levels and it, and it wears me down. It's like exhausting. And, you know, <clears throat> I've had access to things that many others don't and advantages that many others don't, despite the disadvantages I have. And so the more ACEs you have, the adverse child experiences, the more trauma you have, the, you know, all of this accumulates and, and affects our health outcomes and affects our quality of life. And so I just think it's important to be thinking about the social determinants of health and everything we do. And your committee has a lot of influence on the social determinants of health um, if you look at the list um, of, of the, you know, your jurisdiction. So I guess I just coming back to what you were saying, I think in general, we should be looking at how to create more opportunities for education, um, financial education and other kinds of education for all Vermonters. And we need a really diverse 
we need to build that continuum of housing so that our, it would be great if there was a way that even someone who receives assistance was building equity. Like, I don't know if that's le legal, but if the state's paying rent for someone to live somewhere, what if we were paying for someone, for a family to own a home over time, you know, supplementing that? And then maybe the grandchildren will be in a completely different position for the first time in maybe eight generations, you know? So we, we could do that if we, if we, if we bring our heads together and stay focused on that goal. And so I guess I, I appreciate your points and um, hope we can keep talking more about it. And I would encourage you to check out the BIPOC land access bill because it, it, it's one approach to what um, you were suggesting, Representative Martin. So thank you. I don't know if I answered all your points, but, I, but um, I'm happy to answer any other questions you or others have. I, I, I think you did, thank you. Really? Yeah, uh, thank you, Representative Chena, for coming in. Um, we've got a couple of points coming up in the near future uh, with the study that we authorized, actually the contract that was awarded in October uh, to Curtis Reed's organization. We're due for a report in February on that. I'm not sure where it is yet, but February 15th is when it's due to the committee on recommending really a structure for uh, a BIPOC business community and how to best look at some of those uh, discrepancies with how BIPOC businesses have access to capital or to property. And so we're looking forward to that piece. And the other piece, and I think you would agree, is we don't have really good data. Uh, and that data is that we haven't tracked businesses by who owns the business in terms of their rate, uh, race or ethnicity. And so the Secretary of State has embarked on that, but we don't yet have that data. So I'm hoping that we have that so we can really get some kind of measurements in place and be able to identify how do we communicate. And so those are those two data points that were in the bill last year. And I think, I think you would agree, I don't know, uh, to say that those are steps in the right direction. I, yeah, I do. And I think, <clears throat> you know, we introduced this bill last year before that study was conducted. So of course, you know, the legislative processes, we're always trying to take the latest info and, and take that into account. And honestly, what we do this year, in three years, we're going to have to look at it again, because the world is changing fast, the economy is changing fast, and like, especially with like, it, it, um, the impact of climate change and how that's going to drastically impact life and migration patterns and the global economy. And, you know, the, some of you are used to me talking about this artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence is going to rapidly change how we define work during many of our lifetimes. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we're taking some action um, regarding a state level um, use of AI, but there are some recommendations from our AI task force that didn't make it into the bill coming out of house energy and technology because they didn't fit that actually fit in your committee. So I am, I'm going to introduce a short form bill that just lists those recommendations. So I'm happy to talk with you all more about that. But I just uh, want to put that out there that we really need to be looking at all of the reports and studies and taking them into account. And I think there's a lot that um, we are going to learn from that study. And so I'm hoping that, um, you know, the, re the data and results of that study can inform your work on this bill or any actions you take related to this topic. Thank you. Other questions? <clears throat> Brian, if you had, um, I think one of the last points you made was, um, for education and um, apprenticeships, and yes. are there specific? I, I mean, I, I'm I'm having a hard time understanding what apprenticeships you're looking for. Are they new ones, or uh, I, I I guess I I'm, I'm not understanding it because we have apprenticeships. So, um, we don't we don't specify what they should be in. So. You know, this is me weighing in without checking in with the other members of the of the Racial Justice Alliance who helped shape this policy. Um, and, and I'd be happy to, um, you know, I'd be happy to make space for them either today or another time for you to hear their opinion on this. But what, when I read this language, what I think is we would probably entrust the Department of Labor and the state colleges and, the, the, you know, those the Vermont training, the Vermont training program to maybe assess what should these five things be? For example, um, I know that in the trades, um, historically they were male dominated, but in the last 20 years, there have been efforts 
for to get women involved in the trades. And now there's a lot more women doing the trades. And there, um, I know the women's, there's a women's small business development program in Burlington or in Vermont. I know a lot of people in Bur women in Burlington who used it, but like that really helped a lot of women start businesses. So like, I would say that these five programs should, we should probably pick, look at the state's priorities and look at where there's a deficit and try to target them there. If I had to just pick, or well, like if, if, based on what I know, I would think we, we should look at year round regenerative agriculture and BIPOC, you know, farms and workers on farms, but also ownership of farms and agriculture. I would pick construction, um, health care. Um, those are some things and education. Those are some things that immediately pop up to me. When I say education, I mean, child care too, like cradle to grave, you know, like, like more opportunities for people to training the trainers, you know, the idea is that we're training people to train people. So we're just building community competency. That's just my initial response. I would defer to them, to, to the Department of Labor and the state colleges to really come back to us. And maybe, you know, maybe this section could be improved by giving them some guidelines, you know, like saying what I just said, like maybe they look at the reports and they do an assessment. Um, I, something I'm, I, I feel strongly about is that we need to think regionally because um, the state just imposing things on every region doesn't always make sense. And I'd like to see us work more with the regional planning commissions to really be assessing, because um, there's, I think, 11 regional planning commissions, looking at each of those regions, looking at the strengths of the economy, looking at the gaps, looking at how to build circular economies, like how do we attract businesses that could use the waste of one business right next door. So like, you know, maybe like, you know, the wood is milled here and the wood chips go here to be used. And then the wood goes here to build something, you know. Um, so I think like another piece might be trying to um, work with regional planning commissions um, to determine like in different areas of the state where um, might we want to invest in education and apprentice programs, apprenticeship programs, and then trying to encourage um, trying to spread them out to where they're needed. So that's just another thought I have about it. But I would defer to them um, and maybe defer to you to think about, you know, how what process would you want them to use? And also, I think that we'd want to hear from other members of the Racial Justice Alliance. Like, I would want to go talk with them and maybe have, like, Mark Hughes or Wilder White or Ashley Laporte or others come in and um, share their perspective, too. Um, so that's my response to that. Um, it'll probably evolve as I think about it more, but that's my initial response. Yeah, but it, it, so it, it sounds more like more outreach, better outreach, than creating a new apprenticeship program for something different. You know, I mean, we have all kinds of apprenticeship programs now. Sounds yeah. to me like that, that we need, we may need to do better outreach for the BIPOC community to make sure that we're pulling that we're pulling members of that community in as well as all the others. Yeah, I think so. And perhaps that's where we start is we try to make what we have work better while we figure out what we need. And I think in general, that's the case. Like the, the needs of the of workforce is going to change so much. Like on the AI task force, we learned about milking robots and about how that's changing farms in Vermont. And we learned about, you know, how um, AI is going to change healthcare and it's happening quickly. So I bring it up again because that really is one of the major drivers, I think, that we need to be thinking about. Like, we're going to need to be nimble. Like, every few years, we're going to want to be changing. And, and it, it's going to be, I think, increasingly normal for people to have many careers in their life. And to, you know, I did this thing when I was young, but we don't do that anymore. So now I do this thing. And, you know, and maybe when we retire, it's like, you know, I don't have to like beat myself up anymore and work 60 hours a week, but I can do 20 hours a week doing this other new thing. You know, that I think flexibility is going to be important as we move ahead. So, but yeah, I think starting with making what we have now work better for sure, as we figure out what we need. And then we're just going to keep needing to, we just have to accept that like everything we do is going to change and it, it always has, and it always will. I think it's like the nature of the space time continuum, but <clears throat> Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, other questions for Representative Chino? So if you could provide uh, us with a list of people that you would suggest that we talk to, I know I've already talked with Mark, um, had some conversations with him and um, certainly want to have him in, but there, I'm sure there's others that, mm -hmm. that um, are, are 
um, you know, part of this whole process. Mm -hmm. And um, we want to understand the thinking behind it um, because, you know, just the words that we looked at, just what, what I just brought up, you know, the words just looking at it seems to me that we need to start, we needed to start a whole new uh, apprenticeship program. But I think it's more of more inclusivity of bringing people in, making sure that people know what's going on. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, education, outreach, technical assistance that needs to be done in order to assist everybody. Because mm -hmm. I think the whole, I mean, I think this committee is committed to making sure that every Vermonter that wants to work can work and that every Vermonter who wants to start their own business can, can do so. And that the assistance is there, the technical, the, the ability to be able to get into government and find out what I need here, what kind of licenses do I need? And, and you know, that's being built now in the Secretary of State's office with the business portal. So there's a lot of things that are going on that I think take a lot of time, but we need to make sure that everybody is included. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, uh, you know, you said you'd like some witnesses. I, I'll talk with the Racial Justice Alliance and come up with a list. Um, something I'll just throw out there initially is besides hearing from members of the Alliance who worked on our policy, I think hearing from BIPOC financial advisors, real estate agents, small business owners, corporate, because there's, there's BIPOC who work in every part of the economy already. There's BIPOC farmers making an opportunity to hear from people in these different sectors, what's working and not working would be useful and just creating that space. Um, so, you know, I can help you create that list, but you could also think about who do you know in your communities all across the state? You know, if you think about who owns the businesses in your area, are there any BIPOC business owners that you can engage with and learn from them what's working and not working regionally, and then how that connect, connects to state policy? Um, but, but I think the more we hear from the better, the richer the decision will be. So I see another hand. <clears throat> And I would say not just business owners, but um, if we know people that are working in, in, you know, working in the trades or, you know, working as cashiers or whatever, that if we can touch base with people to understand what their struggles are and how they they differ from, you know, they may differ from from other people's struggles, uh, that we can make those changes. Yeah. And I also think how it intersects, you know. Um, that, you know, if you come from a lower socioeconomic status and you're BIPOC and you're LGBTQ or you have a disability, it accumulates and that you have more challenges. And so I think understanding how many of us have intersectional identities. Um, so I appreciate that your sentiment. I think it's good to go beyond business owners. I think bringing both organized and unorganized workers into the conversation is important. Um, empowerment is an important way to address the structural conflict I mentioned earlier. And the more we can share power and disperse power and empower people to make, you know, have more, um, more personal choices and more personal opportunities for personal responsibility um, and, and more knowledge and skills, like the stronger our society is. So um, I'll always support bringing more voices in and I appreciate um, that you took it beyond the business owners, I agree. Emma? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and Brian, to your point about how important regional our regional approach is, I think is really important even in, in the, um, when we start to think about additional witnesses to bring in. So we've talked earlier today about the Vermont Professionals of Color organization, which has really been stood up this last year or so. And so those are not just business owners, those are professionals in all public and private sector, BIPOC identified. And I think that would be a, a really a very, um, important voice to hear and some of their members perhaps they they're growing statewide but maybe to really help us um, make connections in different parts of the state because folks are experiencing very different things um, in depending where they are in the state um, and uh, yeah so I just wanted to make sure that we that that organization was brought back into the mix thank you a good suggestion other questions Representative Gina, you you did it. You you got us out forty five minutes earlier, so you got the gold star today. Oh, uh, thanks. I have to go to my committee. I feel a little negligent, but this is important, and I um I appreciate 
the discussion we've had, I, it, you know, it means a lot that we're giving, it means a lot to me and others that um, we're giving space to this. Um, and I hope that we can continue to um, create space for this discussion and to bring more people into the discussion. So oh, I see another hand, I thought it was safe. Yeah. Yeah, real quick, I just want okay. to say that we had a meeting yesterday with the educational people uh, from North Country uh, CTE, from state colleges. They gave a really good presentation. Um, I'm sure you were, you touched on a whole bunch of stuff that they touched on, actually. Um, and the chairman just asked about I would suggest you go and look it up. It was yesterday's uh, meeting. Can you say it again because my committee chair texted me and it totally distracted me. Um, <laughs> it was yesterday's testimony on what? It was on education for workforce development. And in your included, committee, okay. Yes, and it would All be right. really worthwhile for you to watch it to address some of the issues the chair just raised recently. I'll watch Very it good presentation. <laughs> I'll watch it in bed tonight. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I will watch it at some point. If I'll, I'll take, let me write it down though, because if I don't put it on my to-do list, I probably will forget it, um, but I'll check that out. Okay, thank you. Wednesday, I think it was Thursday morning. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions. So, uh, Representative Chena, thank you very much. It was a great discussion this afternoon. I appreciate you uh, uh, coming in to, to talk to us and, and to present H406 to us. And um, if you can get those, uh, those names to Camille when, at, at your earliest convenience, that would be great. And uh, we'll see, um, time, is, time is not on our side this year. So, we will do our best to uh, see what we can advance this year, but we appreciate um, we appreciate you bringing this to us. Thank you, and I will send in my slides for the record um, right now, Great. and I'll try to get you that list next week, like early next week, maybe Monday. Sounds good. All right, thank, thank you. you. Have a good weekend, everyone. Yeah.